Stephen Clark, welcome to Absolute Reality. Privileged to have you here. And what we're going to do, what we're trying to do with, with these series of um, videos is to get to the bottom of some issues and try and find out what's real and what's fiction and what's just view and what's opinion and what's absolute reality, if you like. So that's why we've called it that. And today we thought we'd look at um, Sam Harris, who you, you know of very well, uh, a very uh, prominent and increasingly prominent atheist uh, who has lots of views on the Bible and lots of views on religion and lots of views on morality. And I thought I'd like to explore some of those things with you with a view to maybe understanding a bit more and also helping other Christians who maybe listen to what he's saying and non-Christians indeed, in fact, who listen to what he's saying yes. and maybe want to question some of those things. So firstly, thank you for coming. Um, Reverend Stephen Clark, of course. Um, Bridge End? Bridge End. Bridge End, fantastic place, yeah. So we'll go straight into it, shall we, if you're okay with that. So Sam Harris, neuroscientist, um, uh, popular author, popular podcaster, has got a lot of followers on his Waking Up With Sam Harris YouTube channel. Very, very popular guy, even more so than people like Dawkins these days. Very popular guy. One of his beliefs is that you don't need religion and you don't need the Bible because you can get morality from nature. Mm -hmm. And I'll just try and I'll try and put his point across and then I wouldn't mind your opinion on his point. I'll try and do the best I can. So he says, look, you don't need the Bible because if you think about it, um, we can all imagine the worst possible situation we could be in. Um, you know, a, a terrible situation, either illness or physical or, or financial, horrible situations you could find yourself in. Mm. And you can imagine something being better than that horrible situation. Therefore, nature itself and life itself teaches you what's better and what's worse, i.e. what's good and what's bad. And therefore you've got a, a system of morality there which explains itself without the need of reference to religion or any code. What do you make of that as a starting point? Yes, I think it's a tangle. There are a number of threads I want to disentangle there, really. Um, first of all, um, one aspect of biblical Christianity is that the Bible is not simply a moral code. That's the first thing. Yeah. The Bible itself teaches um, that human beings uh, have a sense within them uh, of good and evil, right and wrong. So that uh, in one of the major New Testament documents, Paul's letter to the Romans, in the second chapter, he starts to deal with uh, people without access to the Bible of that day, mm. uh, what we would call today the Old Testament. And he makes it perfectly clear there um, that there are people who, as he puts it, who do not have the law, and yet the requirements of the law yep. are written upon their hearts. Uh, uh, what he means by that is that they've got a sense of, of good and evil. It's the sort of thing that C.S. Lewis referred to years ago. I, I think it was in his book, Mere Christianity, yeah. where he said you can travel the world over and, and you find people have a moral sense. So, so that would be my, my first disentangle that thread. So Sam's argument to that, if I can just kind of, as the phrase is, steel man. Here, yes, yeah. like. So his argument would be, well, of course, because everyone knows what pain is. And everyone wants to avoid pain. Therefore, what gives them pain emotionally or physically is bad. What alleviates that pain emotionally or physically is better or good. Yes. Well, well then uh, one comes to his own view of morality. And I think his, the problem there is he's a classic enlightenment yeah. uh, person. Although we're living in the 21st century, um, his, his basic philosophy is that, that reason and science will tell us um, what's good and evil but now wait a minute um with the enlightenment that whole enlightenment project you had people applying the same absolute reason um as they regarded it coming to very different views so the german philosopher mm. immanuel kant comes out with a view of what's known as deontology rules obligation um, what he called the categorical imperative. Then a little bit later, you get a fellow. You get, you have a fellow like Jeremy Bentham mm. in this country. Um, his philosophy is very different. It seems to me that Sam Harris has bought into Bentham's philosophy utilitarianism, that which provides the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Mm. 
Something may cause one pain, but one may think, but this is a good thing to do. Someone may see, um, well, I'll give an example, uh, an example from uh, a friend of my late mother's. Um, her sister was walking one day down a disused railway track many, many years ago with her niece. And she suddenly heard this whooshing noise behind her. She turned to see what had happened. Uh, this rail track was on a slight gradient going downhill yeah. and some boys much further up the track had somehow managed to get a, a track to move wow. and of course because of the gradient mm. this thing was now moving it was gathering uh, speed but there was no motor to it she heard the whoosh but she was there um, with her niece and she realized this thing was going to hit the niece. She threw the niece out of the way. She took the full impact of that. Wow. She had to have both her legs amputated and she was wow. an invalid for the rest of her life. That caused her tremendous pain physically. Mm. It caused her tremendous um, uh, difficulty in her life. Was it a good act or an evil act? Mm. Well, you see, I, I would say what she did was a good act. It was sacrificial. It caused mm. her pain. Mm. Now, of course, Sam Harris may reply, um, yes, but an utilitarian would say um, uh, the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people. Quite apart from the difficulties in calculating that, yeah. um, it, there are all kinds of other problems. Yeah. What if being happy is at the price of freedom? Yeah. So uh, the old joke, um, the, the, the old joke, boys, when the revolution comes, you'll all be drinking champagne. And one fellow says, I don't like champagne. When the revolution comes, you'll be drinking <laughs> champagne, whether you like it or not. In, in yeah. other words, yeah. the whole notion of freedom is being um, yeah. sacrificed there. So, so, so th there's a general observation, but I want to drill down um, much further than that. Because it's, it's more than... Because the relativism is completely missed out in that concept, isn't it, really? So well, one, well, Sam one Harris is a critical relativism, of course. Yeah. Sam Harris is, 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 and this is why he's a classic Enlightenment thinker, he believes that through science and the application of reason, mm. there will be a, a universal good and evil. And, and to that extent, of course, I, I would agree with him that, that if something is right, in a, there are certain things that are absolutely right and certain things that are absolutely wrong. But I don't think he defines really um, what is an absolute standard. Basically, it's what makes us happy. Mm. But then, of course, what if someone else comes along and says, oh, well, I disagree with that. I, mm. I don't think good and evil is a matter of happiness. So I don't think he's taken seriously the views of Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Mm. And um, Nietzsche, it was in the book, Thus Spake uh, Zarathustra. He's, he's got this idea, he, you know, this madman comes down off the mountain, you know, um, we, we, we have murdered God. God is dead, is, yeah. is Nietzsche's idea. Yeah. But Nietzsche had the insight to realize that there were many people in the 19th century who had abandoned um, certainly a belief in the, in, in, mm. in the Christian God, many who'd abandoned a belief in God per se, but they wanted to hang on to certain elements of Christian morality. Mm. And Nietzsche is pointing out, if you do not have an absolute transcendent standard outside of humanity, mm. then you're left with, we make the rules. So mm. Sam Harris comes along with his rules, similar to Jeremy mm. Bentham. Yes, but you're going to have Immanuel Kant and the people who follow his rules. Now, who's to say which are the better rules? Mm. And, and there's no reference point then yeah. outside of humanity. So I, I, I don't... Uh, and as far as I understand Nietzsche, it's quite interesting because as far as I understand his teaching, when he talks about God being dead, it's the influence and effect of God being dead in society, much like happened on many occasions in the Old Testament. Yes, so, you know, so, so everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. Absolutely right. And, and, yeah. um, and in that sense, God is dead. Yes, I, I think what Nietzsche was saying, he, he was very critical, for example, I think of George Eliot, the, um, uh, the, the 19th century novelist, who wrote Middlemarch, books like that. Now she, because of course it was, it was a woman, Mary Ann Evans, and she adopted this uh, mm. man's name, um, because uh, how difficult it was for a woman to get works published under her own name. Um, she, interestingly, as a teenager, she had professed an evangelical conversion. Mm. 
but she abandoned that belief and then she translated a very liberal book by a man called um, David Strauss, a German, The Life of Jesus. And, and she really moved away from, mm. from Christian belief. But she's wanting to hang on to aspects of Christian morality. Now, Nietzsche ridiculed that. Mm. He said, look, it, if, if the foundation is gone, the superstructure mm. that's upon it, you, mm. you've lost the adequate base mm. um, for your morality. Now, I think Nietzsche was on to something very, very important. Well, he there. followed that up with his, um, uh, his account of... of, of uh, uh, times of prisoners under concentration camp settings, that sort of stuff, when if, if, if you've got a why, you can put up with almost any how or almost any what, can't you? So the yeah. idea is if you know, uh, if you've got a reason to live, if you like, you can put up with almost anything you're enduring in order to meet that reason for life. If yeah, yeah. So he, he, he was criticising, what he was really criticising was the inauthenticity yeah. of people who um, have thrown the belief mm out through the front door and try to bring the behavior in through the back door. Um, and what he's saying is if there's no transcendental reference point outside ourselves, mm. Mm. then we've got to make up the rules. Now, I'm thinking of another person, um, very different from Nietzsche, the late Elizabeth Anscombe, mm. who was uh, um, a, a, an Oxford Don for many years uh, in philosophy and then got a chair in Cambridge. She was one of the two or three, I can't remember exactly how many, literary executives of Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, now, she wrote a, a seminal article in a philosophical journal, I think it was in the 1950s, mm. <clears throat> where she said something like this, um, right and wrong uh, conjure up notions of, of law, mm. and to have law you must have a law giver. Mm. And therefore, she said, this idea of speaking about right and wrong without belief um, of a supreme lawgiver, yep. Yep. you can't do that. You can say Fred is kind. Yep. You can say George is generous. You can say Mary is courageous. What you can't go saying is, and they are right to be like that, because mm. she said the moment you start saying they are right, you're implying that there is someone who has laid down no. a law that being kind, being generous, is um, right, so. and being courageous, yeah is how we should be living. Yeah. And it, it, it's funny, I remember my, we, before this started, we spoke about my grandfather. He told me about being in a camp and being amazed at what men would be willing to do to each other when there was no rule of law, yeah. when they knew that there was nothing that would stop them from yes. doing it. And the, the utter brutality yeah. and meanness that came through when there is no absolute wrong and right and there's no yeah. law to stop you from being wrong or right. Yeah, uh, and and that's quite. And of course, Sam doesn't really touch on that because for them, that gave them pleasure, and that gave them joy. Yeah. So by Sam's definition, that's okay. That's morality. Well, yes. In fairness to him, he'd probably come back as an utilitarian would come back and say it's not maximizing the happiness of the greatest number. Um, I, 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 I'm just, I, yeah, I don't know, yeah. but my guess is that's how he would push back yeah, yeah. at that point. So, so I, I would criticise his views of morality at a yeah. number of levels. I would say, number one, he's misunderstood what the Bible is saying. Yep. The Bible never taught, mm. it never taught that um, only people, to use the theological term, with special revelation um, uh, can have a sense mm. of right and wrong. The mm. biblical teaching is that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. Yep. And although that image and likeness is damaged, it's not destroyed. Mm. And people therefore still have a sense of good and evil, right and wrong. Even if they've thrown out belief mm. in God, they cannot throw out the fact yep. that they are still made in the image of God. And, and the irony that that's all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And nothing you can do can ever make that better again yep. oh, yeah you're, yeah, you're separated yeah. from god and in order to be uh, brought close to god again involved a work of somebody else jesus christ and nothing to do with you yeah so, i i think that i think that that's jumping ahead as to what the bible is all yeah, about yeah, yeah. it's not just a moral code it's about a rescue yeah but my point is that for, for sam to say it's all about you know the, the, the idea of a moral code and doing this and doing that the bible's very clear that in fact you can't get no, to no, God absolutely, by doing yes, this and doing that. Yes. So it's it's not that. You yes, know? It, 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 it's not a moral code. Um, it, it, it's a rescue book. Yeah. It, it's it's about God rescuing us. Yeah. Um, but also as well, uh, we need power. 
to 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 live. Um, yeah. Live. It, it seems to me that that, that again, um, I'm not saying Sam Harris is is actually saying this, but the fallacy that Plato had basically was that if people know what's right and wrong, they'll mm. do what's right and wrong. Mm. Well, I, I I mean, one is only going to know one's own heart. And so, w without even reading the Bible, to yeah. realise yeah. that we have all known something is wrong, and we've done it, and we've, done it. And, and we've all known we should have done something, we failed to and do we'll it. Do absolutely right. And, yeah. and in fact, yeah. Paul deploys that argument yeah. in his letter to the Romans yeah. to say, "Look, we all have this yeah. sense of of what is right and wrong, and sometimes our conscience yeah. approves what we have done, yeah. and other times our conscience disapproves yeah. of what we have done, and we have a sense of condemnation." Yeah. And he gets he completely. Frustrated with himself in that, Romans yeah, 7. That, that's history, right. So as we all do. Yeah. So I, I think therefore he's he's um, he's an Enlightenment thinker who simply bought into one view of right and wrong, um, the utilitarian view. Secondly, he hasn't really faced up to Nietzsche's point mm -hmm. that that that's just Sam Harris's view. Somebody mm -hmm. else is going to have a different view, and and why should his view be better than anyone else's? Mm -hmm. He's misunderstood. Um, the idea uh, the Bible is just giving a code, it underlines things which we may know mm. um, a, a, a good and evil. So there are plenty of people out there who've never read a page of the Bible, but they will have a sense of some things being evil, which the Bible says Absolutely. are evil. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. um, also he doesn't take seriously that we need rescuing and that we need empowerment. It's not mm. enough just to know what's right and wrong. Mm. I, I need the power to do what's right and wrong. So he's got some... To do what's right rather than what's yeah, wrong. exactly. He's got some criticisms of... I mean, he, he criticises religion broadly, yeah? And, right. and one of those things is that moral basis that you don't need religion for morality. But then he criticises Christianity specifically on a few issues. He's got criticisms of all religions, but specifically on Christianity, we can look at a few if that's okay. Yes, could, could I just pick up on the religion point there, of course, because um, the, the Bible can be very critical of religion. Yep. Uh, Jesus Christ could be scathing yeah. in some of the things that he yeah. said. Yeah. Um, about uh, religious people, and certainly then the, the Bible can be very scathing. It draws a contrast between false religion mm. um, and true religion. So, uh, so he called he called people whitewashed sepulchres, or, or yes, but that, that, that's because they weren't practicing what they were preaching. Yeah, yeah. But he also refers, and certainly Paul refers, yeah. and the Old Testament refers to um, views of God that are fundamentally wrong. Uh, the, the notion of religion, is, I, I, I think, can be a problematic one mm. in terms of how one defines religion. Mm. Um, and, and there's been some work done on that by various writers who would be critical of Sam Harris's mm. point, uh, mm. uh, approach at that point. How does one define religion? Mm. Um, it, I mean, incidentally, Sam Harris is very open to Buddhism. Mm. Yeah. He, he will say that some practice it as a religion, but it doesn't have to be practiced as a religion. He's particularly critical of monotheistic religions. The three monotheistic religions, Islam, uh, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Uh, he's much more um, mm. indulgent towards Hinduism. He, he takes the view that the monotheistic religions can promote um, uh, you know, violence mm. and acts of terror, whereas he would say that uh, a polytheistic religion like Hinduism doesn't. Well, mm. you know, if, if, if science is all about applying um, evidence-based rules and looking at the evidence, certainly there are people in India at the present time who are suffering grievous oh, violence absolutely. under the BJP party, absolutely. which is committed yeah. to Hinduism. So uh, yeah. I think one's going to be careful there. Yeah. But yes, to, to move on to his specific criticisms then of, of the Christian message. Well, yeah, so he, he's often heard saying things like that the Bible clearly can't be a divine document because it's so easily debunked. Um, uh, and one which he, so there's a few things he comes up with which we can cover, but one which he cites quite often is, well, it says no images. How ridiculous is it? You know, in the commandments, Ten Commandments, no images, and this is his words now. And surely that doesn't make any sense because we can all say images are good and healthy and useful. So to say no images is ridiculous. Yes, well, yeah, he, he likes using that word clearly yeah. that you used. And um, 
often when people who are discussing things where there are deep differences of opinion, when they yep. bring in the word clearly, of course, obvious, I, I think sometimes one's going to you know, flag up a red light there and say, is this a rhetorical yep. device? Well, take this whole thing about images. Yep. Number one, um, uh, the Bible opens in its first chapter with God making an image. Mm. Um, he makes human beings, and the fundamental thing Jesus, about them yeah. is that they are made in his yeah. image. Yeah. Now, that's one of the reasons why um, in the Ten Commandments there's a prohibition of images. The images that are being referred to there are images of God. And the, the, the reason why there has been no images of God, the number of reasons, one, because as Jesus said to the woman of Samaria, God is spirit, and um, as Isaiah says, with whom will you compare me? Mm. He is incomparable, mm. and there is, he, since he is not part of the created order, mm. there can be nothing in creation that adequately represents him. But mm. that having been said, he has done something in making human beings that there is some kind of image there, mm. and that is the image um uh, of of god that 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 is divinely given therefore we should not be making other images of him but the key point you mentioned there is that he kind of either intentionally or otherwise misrepresents i think a little bit of the bible there well, he does. it doesn't say no images it says no images that you then bow down and yes. worship so yes. basically idols things created things that you yes. bow down and worship instead of God. Yeah, yes, and, I, and if he's going to say, if he's almost going to identify the Bible with the Taliban idea, yeah. that you can't have any art or any images, then the problem there is, of course, yeah. that in the very book of Exodus, you have a tremendous amount of artistic work yeah. going into the um, fabric and furnishings yep. for the yep. tabernacle, yep. Um, a, an extraordinary amount of art artistry going into that. Mm. Um, and, and if one sees um, images in that sense of artistry, if one then looks at artistry, you then, you then look beyond there and you find that the Bible is endorsing music. It's endorsing music not mm. only in terms of the worship of God, mm. so that King David in, installs various singers and mm. musicians in the temple, but also it's quite clear um, that music and singing was something that was used mm. culturally mm. and is divinely approved. So um, it, it may suit Sam Harris to line the Christian message mm. up there mm. with a sort of act of terrorism mm. that lay behind the 9-11 um, mm. um, uh, attack upon the, uh, the, the World Trade yeah. Twin Towers. <clears throat> Um, but really, it, 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 that, that won't do, really. He's well, misunderstood well, it. It is a shame that that's disingenuously put, and it would be nice to, to, to see what he said about that, because yes. it's not saying, don't take any photographs, it's not saying anything like no, that. No. It's saying, don't create, don't create a physical god to worship, yes. essentially. Yes. Because I'm the God and I'm not physical. Yes. Uh, and that, you know, makes, because Israel well, gets stuck yes, on that. Yes, it's a very interesting thing, this, because um, you, you find when, when the Apostle Paul goes to Athens, he finds the place is absolutely full up and cluttered up with all these different images uh -huh. yeah. um, and idols. And uh, I've got in the back of my mind, you see, that the Romans... There were certain people in, in, in the Roman Empire who thought of Christians as atheists be, precisely because they didn't have an image yeah. of their God. That's the context. Yeah. Context is important. For example, um, I, I'm quoting another person here, but it's true of me. I may say I've, not, I've only bathed once in the last 25 years. <laughs> yes, but I've, I've had a shower every day. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, the context yeah. is all important, yeah. then, isn't it? Context yeah. is crucial. Absolutely. And, and so when it says don't have images, you've got to look at that, those Ten Commandments yeah. in a context. Yeah. And that context is the Ten Commandments aren't standalone. Yeah. They're the summary, a kind of charter yeah. for the nation of Israel yeah. um, after it had been liberated from Egypt. And for two reasons. One, because this is how you can live best and longest as a community. And two, because this distinguishes you from the pagan cultures, the vicious, yes, yes. murderous pagan cultures yes. that are surrounding you. Yes. And, and that's something which we quickly forget, that actually at those times in the world, there was no rule of law 
there was no welfare state. There was just viciousness, vileness, tyranny everywhere and brutality all around the place. And that's the context in which you're looking at stuff. And for, for God to say these things to Israel in many ways was completely alien to what was happening on earth, you know. To behave in some of the ways he then gets. Well, I, I mean, there were some laws. I mean, some of these people, they, they were, I'm, I'm, I can't remember his dates, but you had Hammurabi, he's called, yeah. but it, it was pretty primitive. And um, a, a, a comparison and a contrast between the Mosaic law yeah. and the um, Hammurabi's code yeah. is, is very enlightening. Now, now, in that connection, there's a fellow who lectures at um, uh, Bristol University. What's his name? Um, Oh, his name is gone from me now. But he's written a book, um, God, Justice and Society, where he, it's an in-depth exploration um, of the Old Testament law, comparing and um, Jonathan Burnside, that's the man's name, Jonathan Burnside. And he, he compares and he contrasts the uh, Old Testament law with that of the nations round about. And he also compares and contrasts it with um, our laws today. Yeah. Now, that book is highly, highly commended by one of our Lord Justices of Appeal, one of the judges who sits in the Court of Appeal. Uh, it's a serious academic work. It's published by, uh, I think it's published by Oxford University Press, mm. and it's, it's highly commended by, you know, one of the more senior judges in the country. Mm. And, yeah, uh, yeah, one's got to dig into the law sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to, there's so much misunderstanding. For even take the phrase an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that that is completely pulled out of context. We speak in the West of knock for knock insurance. Yeah. We do not mean that means if somebody's gone into my car, I can bash their mm -hmm. car. And in fact, in one of the chapters, I think it's Exodus 21, where it speaks of knocking out a um, a slave's tooth, mm -hmm. you've got to let him go free. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean then he hits your tooth out. It mm -hmm. means the punishment fits the crime so two or the proper there. compensation. Yeah. Right. Not only the punishment fits the crime, but actually a pauper's tooth is worth as much as a king's tooth. Yep. Yes, yes. So, and, and this is something amazing that comes into the Judeo-Christian moral ethic is the equality of mankind, yeah, men yes, and women. Yes. So everyone is made in the image of God. Yes. Before God, everyone is equal. Yes, so, you know, no, well, well, they're, they're, equal, tooth they're tooth. equal in the sense, yeah. we're all equal in terms of our standing before yeah. God, in terms of our dignity. That doesn't mean to say we're all equal in terms of the abilities that God no, no, gives. You've absolutely. got Jesus' parable yeah, of the talents. Yeah. One man is given yeah. ten, one man is given five. Yeah. So take Sam Harris. Yeah. Um, uh, he's obviously got a, a good scientific head mm. on him. Other people haven't been blessed with such a, mm. uh, an ability. But, but our equality before God does not depend mm. upon those gifts or abilities that God has distributed, but mm. that we bear God's image and so, likeness. So Sam's next criticism in that case kind of touches on that. And speaking of the, the context and the equality of man, um, he criticizes heavily the fact that slavery isn't condemned in the Ten Commandments. Right. And even seems to be condoned throughout the Old Testament. And he says, well, clearly, we all now know that slavery is wrong and vile. So why was it not only not condemned, but openly accepted in the Old Testament? That well, would be yes. well I, I mean, there are just so many things that it's almost difficult to know um, where, where to jump in. Yeah. Um, as I said, the Ten Commandments are a summary, a kind of charter. They could almost be regarded as the marriage lines of a marriage covenant between Israel and the Lord. And indeed, as far as I know, th there were two tablets of stone and they didn't have five commandments on each. No, there were be, ten on each one. That, that, that's right. That, because that, that's that, how a contract is written. That was standard that's in that so day and age. Yeah, yeah. So, so that the one yeah. ta tablet would be, as, as it were... Um, yeah would be with a king yep. and the other with the people and, and so that's what you've got there so god is, is using Absolutely things right. with which the people were very familiar yep. but you see uh, the bible never says that the ten commandments are the be all uh, mm. uh, and end all of everything mm. so one day 
there are lots of commandments in the Old Testament, over mm. 600 of them. Mm. And one day, um, someone's trying to trip Jesus up and he comes to him and he says, you know, which, which is the greatest commandment? Yeah. Now, significantly, Jesus does not quote from the Ten Commandments. Mm. He, he says the greatest commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, mm. and you shall love the Lord your God with all mm. your heart and mm. with all your mind and with all your strength. And then, for good measure, he then says to the um, his inquirer, and he says the second commandment is like it, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Yeah. Now, many of those Ten Commandments um, uh, give expression to what love to neighbour will involve, mm. give concrete expression to it, so you don't bear false witness against your neighbour, yeah. you don't murder your neighbour, you don't commit adultery, and they also give concrete expression as to what it would mean for Israel to love the Lord their God. Um, but but you, you can't just look at the Ten Commandments in isolation. I mean, mm. let me take a fairly distasteful subject. Um, you come to the Leviticus chapters 18 and 20, yep. and you have a whole list of sexual things that are referred to there, mm. uh, amongst which is bestiality. Mm. Well, that's not specifically condemned in the Ten Commandments, is mm. it? Mm. Um, unless you're going to subsume it under the category of adultery, which you, you, you may seek to do. Mm. But what I'm getting at is you don't just look at those Ten Commandments mm. on their own. Mm. That's the first thing. Mm. Um, then the second thing is, I don't think Sam Harris is taking account of the fact that the Old Testament law was not just a moral code. It wasn't that. It, it, was, it was also a legal code for a nation state. Any legal code has to tolerate certain things of which it may not approve. I'll give an example. Um, not in the Ten Commandments, but um, when you get to uh, elsewhere in, in the Old Testament law, you have regulations with respect to divorce. Mm. Now, the problem arose that people began to think that, that, that as long as you follow the correct procedure for a divorce, everything was all right, mm. and, and God was very happy with that. Mm. But the prophet Malachi says God hates divorce. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean, say, all divorce. The divorces that were being practiced at that time mm. under cover of, oh, well, well the, the, these are the regulations, this is how we to, to have a divorce. And by the time you get to Jesus, Jesus says, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted this. This was a particular type of divorce. This wasn't divorce, no dealing with someone who'd been unfaithful or with somebody who'd beating up his wife. This, this, this was a man who'd tired of his wife. He, he, he found a... Um, something offensive about her, perhaps because, you know, like a man with a car, the car's got a bit, you know, old and he wants to change it for a new model. Right, right. We're in that kind of territory. And Jesus says, for that, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted you. But it was not this way from the beginning. And he then goes on, he says, and I say to you, that anyone who divorces his wife except for, and then he gives he, he gives an exception where he divorces, is, is allowed, um, is, is in effect committing adultery. Mm. So, that, that's a fundamental distinction in any legal system. And, and so, then, if, if I can just add this, so for example, there are things in, in UK law which are not illegal, that is, they're not criminal offences, but they're not lawful. Yeah. Um, they, they, they're not lawful. So for many years, gambling um, was illegal in this country. Um, then it was legalised. But it, it was still unlawful in the sense you couldn't enforce a game in contract in the courts. Mm. Um, prostitution has been legalized mm. um, in the sense it's not a criminal offense, but it's not lawful. Mm. It's not lawful. The, 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 there are lots of things around mm. that. This, it doesn't mean that the, the law is approving of it. Yeah. So, so that's another observation about slavery here. Before we come on to the actual substantive issue itself, and, and the problem there is that he can be reading uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, for that matter, yep. through the lens of 19th, 18th, 19th century slavery. Uh, think of someone yeah. who, a friend of mine, his son went through university and he signed up with the RAF. And the RAF paid all his tuition fees, the lot, yep. and not just his tuition fees, they paid his um, living expenses, and he had quite a bit of money left over. Uh, but, of course, there was a price for that, and the price was now he's, he's going to be in the RAF for so many years. Well, is that slavery? Mm. Well, well, it's not. Now, it's exactly the same in the Old Testament. You, yeah. You'd have a person who perhaps was um, 
very, very poor. Um, they, they'd got, or perhaps they, they, they'd been foolhardy. They got into debt. They couldn't pay their debts. But what did you do? Well, they, they became a slave. That didn't mean the sort of slavery you had in, in, in the United States. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole problem you had there. Um, it, it wasn't that sort of slavery at all. And, and in fact, you're right, because the Old Testament actually condemns to death anybody who steals another person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's an offence punishable by death. And and and, and then every clear. seven years, yeah. slaves were to be uh, yeah. a, a slave was to be released after seven years. And this is the slaves you're talking. So it's it's again we didn't have or there wasn't a um, a welfare state. That's right. So if if you had no money, if your husband had died, if you were a woman, for example, or or if your crops had failed. You were destitute. Yes. And how were you supposed to live, literally? How would you live? Yes. Well, you might do, instead of joining the RAF, you might say, can I work for you for X years yes. in return for the food which will stop me from dying? Well, you have that even in the before the days of Moses. You have with Jacob. Mm -hmm. he, has a, he has a bust up with his brother. His brother wants to kill him. Yep. Um, the, the mother realizes this is pretty desperate. She packs him off to her brothers, his uncle Laban. He goes there, he falls madly in love with uh, Laban's daughter, <laughs> Rachel. But of course, he hasn't got any He's money. He's a bit of a sucker, isn't he? So he, he ends up working for a long time. Yeah, he has, but he hasn't got any money. And of course, dowry was important. In that context, mm. in that, as it is in some other societies, they yeah. dowry. What's he going to do? So he, he effectively indentured himself yeah. to his yeah. uncle for seven years. Yeah. To work for her. So you had this years ago. I, I, I mean, when I worked in the law, I remember having, having to look at um, having to look at some very old leases. Uh, leases, in fact, uh, around here in Cardiff. Very interesting was too. And in those days, um, you'd have two parts to the lease, and the lease would be cut in a certain way so you could put the top part mm. to the bottom. Now, the same thing, I think, used wow. to happen with apprenticeships. Yeah. An apprentice was indentured to the master, and the, the um, terms of apprenticeship would be drawn up in such a way, and, and they would be cut so that you'd have a curved yeah. part, and yeah. you could, they, they could fit together. Uh -huh. So that apprentice was bound in yeah. contract yeah. to his... Um, to, to, to the master under whom he was learning. Mm. Now today, I, I mean, in, in, in British law, um, for breach of contract, you normally get damages. In, in certain unusual circumstances, you can get what's known as specific performance, where the other person is ordered to perform the contract. It's yeah. a perfectly technical area of law. But, but you, you, you don't get specific performance of employment contracts. Mm. Now, the, the, okay, things have moved on. I, in effect, you could say that uh, Old Testament slavery was a little bit like specific performance of a of a an employment contract. I'm in need. I can't pay you, but I'll work for you. Yep. The old joke that you go to a restaurant and suddenly the um, the bill is much more than you realised, and you haven't got any, mm -hmm. you haven't got enough money. For, I'll, I'll wash the dishes for you, and you mm -hmm. say it's a bit of a joke, yeah. but but it's that kind it's of that thing kind with of Old thing. Testament slavery. Yeah. Now, when you come on to the New Testament, of course, you've got. Um, Roman slavery, which was uh, which is a very complex phenomenon, Roman slavery, and it covered a range of situations. So that some slaves had very high positions. Some, of course, were really being treated as virtually worse than dirt. Mm. Now, uh, it's sometimes pointed out that the New Testament doesn't outrightly condemn slavery there. Well, for, for the very simple reason that you've got this um, young, nascent movement, Christians, you've got this um, tremendously powerful empire. Mm. Well, there's no way you could have protested against slavery and overturned things at that time. Mm. What you have is an indirect approach that through the teaching of the, of the gospel, uh, the, as Jesus said, that the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. Um, put into a barrel of dough and it permeates the whole and as the Christian gospel mm. permeates it, it affects your view of people so you have James, I was only reading this this morning in, in, in the second chapter of his letter he speaks about a, a church gathering 
and one person comes in in fine clothes and a gold ring and somebody else comes in in shabby clothes, you, you don't say, he says to the mm -hmm. well-dressed person, oh, you sit here, I say to the shabby dressed person, you get on the floor by mm -hmm. my feet. You, mm -hmm. you treat everyone as equal. Absolutely. And so one of the loveliest letters in the Bible is Paul's letter to Philemon. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Philemon had a slave, Onesimus. Onesimus has run away from his master. Very serious offence in the Roman Empire to do that. He, he bumped into Paul. It seems he'd met Paul, and under Paul, he came to faith in Jesus. Mm. Paul, however, was a good friend of Philemon's. So what does he do? He, he, under the sort of terms of, of the law of the Roman Empire, he didn't harbour this slave. He sends him back to Philemon, but he writes a letter. It's a beautiful letter. And, and you can tell, as you read between the lines, Paul is saying, you, you treat this man now honourably, you, you look after him. It, it was this indirect approach. Mm -hmm. And of course, that ultimately led in the 19th century to um, you know, Wilberforce's campaign to mm -hmm. abolish, first of all, the slave trade. <clears throat> and of course, we've got to distinguish Old Testament slavery from the slave trade, you know, where somebody's just well, grabbed and, and sold. And that's the point. It's a very, very different thing. Totally different. Somebody having to work for somebody, or somebody's children even totally having to different. work for somebody in order to live or survive, totally or different. to pay a debt, yes. or to pay a punishment for a crime. Yes. Very different things from somebody yes. literally stealing a person's life, yes. which actually is condemnable by death in the yes. Bible. And you have so to see as well that Israel things. was surrounded by these nations, yeah. Yeah. Which, which would have had slavery. So there were certain things that the nations around did where God God said, no, mm. that, that is that. You just don't do it. And, and but there were, other, there were other things which he tolerates. Yeah. He doesn't necessarily say he's approving it. He tolerates and he regulates it and he brings humanity into it. Until such yeah. time, um, Paul in his letter to the Galatians clearly teaches that the Old Testament um, what was a period of the infancy stage mm. of God's people mm. and quite a lot in the law that was given to Israel was part of an infancy code. Mm. So just as you go into mm. A, mm. perhaps a primary school, a reception class, they'll have up on the wall uh, an, a, an apple and underneath an A and a ball and underneath a B, a cat and a C. Right, but you go into You're the sixth form English yeah, class, yeah, yeah. They, they don't have that up on their own. Yeah. Right, Paul says, in the infancy yeah. stage, God yeah. was using pictures, he was using symbols, yeah. he was having to accommodate himself to certain things that were going around and permitting them. With the coming of Jesus, that changes. We've, we've, we've now reached um, a maturity stage in the history of the people of God. And we are progressing. So, for example, um, uh, uh, another thing which, which I think Sam has criticised is things like if, if the children in the Old Testament disobeyed their parents, they would come before the elders who would decide whether they got stoned to death. And you might think, that's a bit brutal, that's awful. But what was it replacing? It was replacing the ability of anybody to kill their children with impunity. Yes. So actually, yes. that sounds brutal, yes. but it saved lives. And there's no record anywhere ever, either in Jewish history or in the Bible, of any elders ever saying, yes, let's stone the children for disobeying their parents. Yes. So in fact, something which on the face of it looks brutal, as you're saying, was... was developing a nation and actually saved lives. Yes, and I think um, I think it's in Exodus 21 where it speaks about um, uh, cursing one's parents being put yeah. to death. But in mm. fact, if one looks at the Hebrew, then the whole context, and this is something which um, uh, is brought out in that book by Jonathan mm. Burnside mm. And, and by a number of scholars, mm. actually it, it, it's dealing perhaps with a, a serious situation of domestic violence. Mm. Um, serious domestic violence. Yeah. I think your point there is a really important one. Um, what was the alternative? What was going on in these other societies? Because um, think of licensing laws mm. in this country, licensing premises um, to conduct gambling. Mm. Um, why do we have licensing? Because a licensing system is better than an unlicensed system. Mm. Now, as I said, that doesn't mean to say that the state is approving of something. That's a very good analogy. In, 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 the days when, um, in the days when gambling was illegal, of course, it was underground. Mm. You had all the um, crime. One thinks of, of what was going on in the East, east End of London and, and, the, and the gang warfare. Mm. Um, Supposing we, we were to move to a situation in this country where 
certain classified drugs um, were, were decrimin the taking the possessing of them were to be decriminalized, but there were to be some licensing system. Now that would not mean that the country would be approving of people possessing um, these substances. It, it, it may be a way of saying, well, actually, at the moment, there's so much crime mm. attached to this. If, if, if we bring it above board and we start licensing it, mm. it may choke off an awful mm. lot of crime. Mm. Of course, but all that will happen then is probably the crime will push on to somewhere else. Mm. So I think that's important, this, this regulating. Another thing uh, that often isn't picked up, um, uh, lawyers would distinguish between substantive laws and procedural rules for enforcing those laws. Mm. And, and all these things with the death penalty in the Old Testament, of course, always required two witnesses. Mm. And that was and the maximum penalty. It, that was the maximum yeah, penalty. It wasn't always enforced. It, always, it wasn't always enforced. It was the maximum penalty. And in many, many cases, it would never be yeah, enforced yeah, yeah. because yeah. A, it required two witnesses. And B, the witnesses, yeah. um, if it were found that they were bearing false testimony, the same penalty then would come upon their own head. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you, you, you just read these laws, oh, you know, this is the death penalty, this is the death penalty, this and that. No, no that, that was, it, it was tied to procedural rules which meant in many situations that death penalty would never and could yeah. never be carried out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's there, it's there as a deterrent, and it's there just like we have deterrents for serious crimes today. Well, I, uh, not just. It, I think it was expressing the gravity of what was happening as well. Wow, yeah. this is a serious penalty, yeah. Yeah. but it wouldn't mean the penalty would always be carried out. And yeah. often, it, often it wouldn't. Often yeah. it wouldn't be carried out. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, why, why do you think? Why do you think there's so much objection to, so if, if you take the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, right? Why is there so much objection? I mean, there's nothing from what I can see there, you know, uh, uh, okay, you might say, well, I don't believe in a God, fair enough. Um, so you might not want to honour his day or honour his name. But then what's wrong with respecting your parents? What's wrong with not killing? What's wrong with not stealing, not lying? Not committing adultery, not being. Well, I, I think what's wrong with those things? I Why think a lot of people so would would say that a lot of Ten Commandments they would agree with. Yeah, I I do think that. Um, uh, why do you think? And it's a slight segue, maybe, but why do you think there's a lot of anti-Semitism? I've often asked myself this, and I don't know what the answer is. What? Why? Well, I would give a very theological answer to that. And I would say that anti-Semitism in the Old Testament, you get it in the book of Esther, yeah. massively, where Haman wants to obliterate the entire yeah. entire Israeli people, yeah. um, the entire Jewish nation. I think it's all tied up with God made a promise to Abraham that it would be of, of Abraham mm. that the Messiah, the, the Savior, would come. Mm. And I, I, I would see that behind the actions of a character like Haman, are the very devil himself? Is the very so you devil think it's himself? A spiritual thing. I think there. Then I think coming on into the uh, our own day and age and historically, I think that um, I, I, I take someone like Hitler. Whatever were the psychological um, factors that were influencing him, mm. again, uh, in in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter eleven, there's there's considerable debate how one interprets it. Um, hardening has, uh, is, has experienced hardening until the full number of the Gentiles come in mm. and so all Israel will be saved. Now whatever that means, mm. th this much is clear that the people of Israel, the Jewish people, will continue mm. as an ethnic group mm. until the full number of people, um, uh, of, of non-Jewish people, Will who are to be saved are saved, and again I would see that this is almost a, a, a not almost it, I think it is a satanic thing mm. that the devil wants to stop that happening mm. and and to wipe out the Jewish people um, is one of the ways of doing it. Now then, um, that doesn't answer all the questions. What why, why people are anti-Semitic mm. uh, in terms of their own psychology? Because um, there are a number of. Um, 
uh, non-believers and in fact atheists maybe who would say that they that they're, they're Christians without believing in Christ i.e. the moral code is a good thing for a society yeah. to follow and you've got people like Douglas Murray writing books about Europe saying well actually whether or not Europe believes we ought not let go of this kind of um, sociological underpinning yes. environments because it's good. Yes, I, I mean, just adding one thing, of course, there has been, and I think one's going to be honest here, um, sadly, the so-called Christian church has sometimes been pretty anti-Semitic. Yeah. Um, Martin Luther said some pretty horrific mm. things about the Jews. Um, initially, initially, um, he, he took a different view, mm. but when he found that they weren't embracing the message that he was preaching, he said some pretty awful things, mm. and I've I've in, I've got it in the back of my mind. I can't give you chapter and verse on this, but I've got it in the back of my mind that Hitler was able to appeal to some of Luther's mm. statements, and that gave him tremendous leverage. Mm. Um, then, of course, you balance that that in this country, the person who granted toleration to the Jews was Oliver Cromwell. Mm. Oliver Cromwell is always regarded as you know, this, this sort of terrible man, but actually, mm. in many ways, he's a very tolerant man. Mm. Um, hence, his statue outside the House of Commons, and it was Simon Sharma, who's Jewish, in his History of Britain, mm. uh, you know, flagged this up. Uh, you know, uh, Oliver Cromwell gave toleration to us as mm. Jews. But you, this anti-Semitism, it, it, it comes through in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. I mean, it's a very strong mm. note there where, where I think Shakespeare's tapping into. I think that there were certain historical things at the time when he wrote mm. Romeo and Juliet. Mm. He, 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 he was tapping into, there was a certain anti-Semitic mood. And, it, and it's such, because I it just, it, it's got to be spiritual, because when you think, there are 14 million Jews, one four. That's nothing in the context of nearly 7 billion people on the planet. Well, they're a remarkable so people, aren't they? Because you just think, wow, that's remarkable. Well, they're a remarkable <laughs> people. Um, the, the, the number of Nobel Prize winners yeah, who are Jews. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I've just been rereading the biography of but well, not the biographies, it's a series of um, reflections on the life of the late Sir Isaiah Berlin, great mm. sort of uh, historian of ideas. And um, yeah, it's very interesting to see his mm. observations on Jewishness because he was a Jew in mm. this country. But mm. yes, I mean, I, I suppose that's taking us a bit away from it Sam is, Harris. Yeah. Um, but I think we've, do you think we've dealt with Sam Harris? I mean, well, I, I, I've difficulty with this view of the, science. In the nicest possible way. Well, I've difficulty with this view of science. science. Yep. Um, what is science? Look at it generally, first of all. Um, these days, it's a collaborative project. It, it's, it, it obviously involves lots of people working together. Yep. It's yep. highly specialized these days. And then there'll be a whole raft of um, uh, uh, specialized journals, the peer reviewed and research papers get published there. Yep. But his idea that science is some kind of great objective reality, I don't want to query that at a number of levels. Mm. I don't I want to query it, first of all, at a, 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 a sort of a social level and then at a much deeper intellectual mm. level. So, so it's like God makes man, man makes science, science kills God would be where well, Sam comes from. Well, <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, who was the chap who, who, who said these words? Um, it was a former editor of Nature magazine said, uh, my grandfather preached the gospel of uh, Christ. Yeah. My father preached the gospel of socialism. I preached the gospel of science. Mm. But yeah, I, I, I want to cri critique his view at two levels. First, a more surface level, um, yeah, who decides which research projects are going to be carried out? Mm. They've got to be funded. Mm. Where does one get funding from? Mm. All I'm getting at there is science is an activity. Yep. It's an activity of science, scientists, and one's going to be careful not to reify it in, in, into a kind of thing mm. that just mm. exists apart from the people who practice it. Yep. Now, the people who practice it, are going to be a range of people. There are going to be all kinds of things operating. So there may be funding only available for one of two excellent research projects. Well, the one doesn't get funding, the other one does. Mm. And that, that, that's a simple mm. fact. That's not criticizing science. That, mm. that is just saying that's how it operates. But I want to pin down at a much deeper level because Sam Harris seems to have this idea that you know, science is a great objective reality. Mm. Well, I, I'm going to wind back to David Hume, the 18th century philosopher, no friend of Christianity. Yep. And 
Uh, we'll go to a bit of technical detail here. I, I remember once, uh, we, we have a big questions in our church every so often, where, uh, on a Sunday night. It's not like a typical Sunday service where we put tables and chairs around that he eats, and th there's no singing. I just get up and I speak on a subject, and then we have Q&A. On one occasion, I was going to go down this route, mm. and um, I, I said, are you still with me? And people nodded, and a bit later I said, you're still with me? And my wife chirped up, and she said, we've had enough. And she was, so, I, so I'm going to go into a bit of a technical area here, but I think it's an important area. Let's take David Hume, the philosopher. Check his wife's not out there. Right. Please. So, um, deduction, deduction, deduction. Yeah. Deduction, deductive logic, starts with a general proposition, moves on to a particular example, draws a conclusion. Right. For example, um, general proposition, the sum of the interior angles of a triangle on a plane surface is 180 degrees. Right. right. Particular statement, shape ABC mm. is a triangle on mm. a plane surface. Yep. You can then draw your conclusion, therefore the sum of the interior angles of shape mm. ABC is 180 degrees. Yep. Now that's a valid argument. Even if you were to say, even if you were to say the sum of the interior angles of a triangle on a plane surface is 210 degrees, shape ABC is a triangle on a plane surface, therefore the sum yeah. of the interior angles of um, shape ABC is 210 degrees, that would still be a valid argument Based because it would be untrue. It would be untrue because it isn't true that the sum of the interior angles of a triangle on a plane surface is 210. Yep. It is true that the sum of the interior angles of a a yep. triangular plane surface is 180 degrees. Right. So as long as your, if the argument is valid, then as long as your general proposition, your major premise, and your particular proposition, your minor premise, as long as they are true, the conclusion, because the conclusion is valid, mm. is bound to be true. Right. Okay. That's how deductive logic works. Mm. You now, science works a bit differently, doesn't it? It starts not with a general rule. It, it makes observations. Mm. It sees a problem. It wants to solve the problem. It, 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 it suggests um, perhaps some hy a, a hypothesis about this problem and, and experiments to test it, etc. And what it does, it builds up lots of examples. It doesn't work deductively. Mm. It works inductively. Now what David Hume said was this, you cannot with any number of particular examples universalize to this general proposition. And the classic example that's often given is this, all swans are white. Yes, mm. but it only takes one black swan mm. to falsify that. Mm. So the idea that science is all about ga gathering lots and lots of observation and data whereby you know you get a hypothesis and eventually you, you construct an explanatory mm. theory and that gives you true mm. truth. Mm. That can't be so. Unless this be thought just to be, oh well those are the musing of musings of an eighteenth century philosopher living in an ivory tower. So what you're saying is a lack of proof of God isn't proof of lack of God. No, no, I'm saying something different. I, I'm dealing with science. I'm saying science cannot um be about proving things to be true and that this isn't just an abstract philosophical point is demonstrated by the following after isaac newton for a few hundred years it was really thought well isaac newton has sorted out so much we've mm. got a mechanistic mm. universe so much so that by the 19th century you know this is it newton's laws of you know motion mechanics yep. etc yep. gravity then in 1905, a patent officer in Bern in Switzerland writes an article which he submitted, I think, to the journal as the Annals of Physics. Mm. The editor, and going on memory, I think the editor was Max Planck. As he turned the last page, he realized this man has overthrown Newtonian physics. Newton's physics were unassailable. Mm. But that 1905 article by Albert Einstein, mm. which really expounded his theory of special relativity, demonstrated that Newton's idea of absolute time, mm. that's the same, and absolute space couldn't be true. And then 10 years later, Einstein follows that up 
in 1915 with his theory of general relativity, which challenged and overthrew Newton's ideas of gravity. Mm. His inverse square law, of course, operated on the basis that there is a, a force operating at a distance. Mm. And I, Einstein's point is, well, how can a force operate at such a distance? Nothing travels faster than the speed of life, mm. light. So he, he then changes it so that now gravity is not uh, an attractive force between two massive objects. Gravity is rather all to do with objects in space-time, mm. curving space-time. So something that was regarded as absolutely unassailable Hmm. was overthrown. Now, the, the 20th century philosopher Sir Karl Popper, he, 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 gave that, he gave other examples as well of the fact that, that, that Hume was onto something big. So science is not about verifying, hmm. it's about falsifying. Hmm. And so what, what Popper said was, the best theories are those which you attack for all you are worth in, in, by the experimental method. The more you attack them and the more the theory stands up, the better the theory is. But you can never arrive at a point where you can say this theory is the last word mm. because people thought that with Isaac Newton mm. and along comes Albert Einstein. And, and I, I don't know if there's a physicist in the world today who would accept um, Newton's views of uh, uh, absolute time. I, I, Einstein overthrew that. Mm. Mm. So, Popper's view is science is about falsification. Mm. Now, I, I, I don't think that um, Sam Harris has taken that on board at all, because the serious thing then is, of course, let's say science is going to tell us how we, to, we can be moral. Mm. And let's say in some way Newtonian physics tells us how to be moral. What do you do a few hundred years later mm. when your Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein comes along and says, oh, he, 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 Newton got it wrong? But, it then means yeah. your morality yeah. that's built on it is also wrong. But, but that's what, I mean, Sam will, will accept that's what science doesn't do. It doesn't give any value to its output. So the fact that um, uh, science may have come up with a, 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 a bomb, a hydrogen bomb, Science cannot attribute any value as to whether that's a good or a bad thing. No, but he will say that science will tell us to, to how we can find out what's good and evil. Well, that he will goes, tell, and yeah, he's that, almost that, an echo of yeah. Bertrand Russell. Yeah, yeah, that goes back to his, yeah, all the way back to the beginning, doesn't it? And his yeah. philosophy that you can get morality from nature. Yeah, yes, and, and, what, and what I'm yeah. saying is, is, is that he's got a view of science yeah. there, yeah. Um, which which is, is, is really, I would say, outdated and outmoded. Yeah. I mean, there are different philosophies. You've got Thomas Kuhn's uh, idea, um, what is it, the structure of scientific revolutions, mm. where he speaks about paradigm shifts, mm. etc. But the idea that there is just, uh, I, I'm a critical realist, mm. so I, I, don't, I don't buy the idea that um, uh, all science is just sociologically conditioned. Yeah. I, I think that's wrong. And, and Richard Dawkins, I think, is dead right when he says nobody believes that when he's flying in an aeroplane at 30,000 uh, yeah. feet yeah. because you depend upon, right, mm. people have sussed out the laws of um, uh, aerodynamics, etc. I mean, so there's two things there. One is there are areas of ignorance in science, things we don't know, and yes. things we don't know we don't know. Yeah. Yes. Um, but then there's the whole kind of Blaise Pascal thing that the whole the supreme achievement of reason is to teach us that there is an end of reason. So there are limits yeah. to reason, yeah. absolutely. So the logical absolutely. process yes. has a limit and there yes. is stuff which will never be subservient to the logical process. Yes. And, and Sam's point that science can teach us morality, that's not yeah. a scientific statement. Yeah. That's it's a philosophical yeah. statement. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one of the problems with um, new atheists, as they are called, and they're not so new now, yeah. like... Um, Sam Harris, like Dawkins, was illustrated in uh, a debate in the Sheldonian Theatre in Oxford. It was live streamed between um, Richard Dawkins and the then uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. Ah, the philosophy one. Now, it was very interesting, yes, mm. because it was chaired by Anthony Kenny. Now, Anthony Kenny is an interesting character. He'd been a Roman Catholic priest, yeah. and then he lost his faith. Um, he'd be agnostic. Yeah. He, he's he's respectful. He's very respectful to a, a Christian philosopher called Alvin Plantinger, yeah. and, and is lectured with him. Uh, but anyway, he's in the chair now. Dawkins made made his point, and at one level, of course, it's a, it's a good point. He said to try to explain the universe in terms of God is is a is a 
bad, wrong argument because you're taking something very complex, the universe, mm -hmm. but you're bringing something more complex, God, to explain it. Now, as a general observation, that's valid. It, good explanations explain the more complex by going back to uh, simpler things. Mm -hmm. But you see, Anthony Ken, who was chairing it, said to Dawkins, now wait a minute, he said there are two sorts of simplicity. There is structural simplicity and functional simplicity. And this is quite important to understand. This it? is crucial. He said, now, a cutthroat razor is structurally very simple. Yeah. You've got a handle, you've got a blade. Yeah. But functionally, it can be complex. Yeah. It can shave someone, yeah. but it can also, you could pair off a, yeah. um, a, an arrow. Yeah. You could cut someone's throat with it. Yeah. Okay? By contrast, he said, an electric razor is structurally very complex. Mm. Yeah, well, not very complex, but it's much more complex yeah, than yeah. A, yeah. A, 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 an open razor. Yeah. Um, but although it's structurally complex, functionally, it's pretty simple. What yeah. does it do? Yeah. Well, it just shaves your face. That's all it kind of does. Yeah. Now, he said, you know, you've got to sort out, when theologians speak of the simplicity of God, yeah. They don't mean he's functional. He said, well, now at that point, Dawkins, oh, oh well, he said, you're, you're talking philosophy. He said, if you wanted a philosophical discussion, you should have invited a philosopher rather than a scientist. Now, that was a cop-out because the sorts of statements Dawkins was making mm. and many of the statements that are in some of his books, especially his book, The God Delusion, mm. are statements not of a scientific <clears throat> but of a philosophical, philosophical nature. So once yeah. you get into that territory... Mm. It's no good then um, lamely complaining, almost whinging, uh, mm. if one were to be unkind. So, well, I'm not a philosopher and I, and I can't mm. understand this. Well, mm. if so, you shouldn't be getting into that kind of discussion in the first place. Mm. Uh, and uh, um, going back to Popper and his views of Newton and uh, his, his, his treatment of, of Hume's view of the problem of induction. Mm. It's not ivory tower stuff because Popper was hugely influential upon some great scientists. So the late Sir Peter Medawar, who incidentally is one of Dawkins' great heroes, would say that uh, Popper was the influence on his thinking. The Nobel Prize winner, Sir John <coughs> Eccles, neurophysiologist, um, won the Nobel Prize for medicine. Yep. He um, leans heavily on Popper's work, so Herman Bondi, who I think is an atheist. So, so th what I'm getting at, th these men are not necessarily mm. friends of the Christian faith, mm. but, but they see the importance of what Popper said, and he's drawing on what Hume said, and it really is coming into head-on collision mm. with this rather simplistic view um, that science is all about mm. verifying, and once we've done this, we can now say we've arrived at this point. But science is nevertheless incredibly valuable. Oh, absolutely. Well, the, yeah, and, absolutely. The men I've quoted. Would... And in many ways, you know, in terms of, I know there's often a debate in the States about um, evolution, creation and, and the teaching of science. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that often is a very unfortunate debate. I yeah. think I think that, yeah, I, I, I think... That, the, that I think that's part of a broader issue going on in the States to do with culture wars. Yep. Um, and I, I, I don't distance myself from, from some of the stuff that yeah. emanates from the States there yeah. because I think... But I don't think they're yeah. mutually exclusive, you see. I think you can, you can believe that God can create anything in any time. Yeah. So either six days or, or, you know, God is the creator and can yes. create, otherwise he wouldn't be God. Yeah. That's very separate from saying we have a scientific method which is there to analyze the physical world in this methodology, uh, which is valid in and of itself. Yes. And you needn't confuse the two. Well, yes, and you get it in the New Testament. For example, you get Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount um, saying, you know, love your enemies, uh, that you may be children of your Father mm -hmm. in heaven, mm -hmm. for he causes his son to rise on the righteous and the unrighteous yeah. and causes his reign to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now then, he's not speaking of sunrise. We speak of sunrise. Yeah. We don't literally believe the sun rises. Yeah. He's saying God is doing this. Yeah. But in his parable in Mark's gospel of the growing seed, only mm. Mark records this parable. Mm. Interestingly, he says the farmer plants the seed and then whether he sleeps or wakes, all by itself it <clears> grows. 
knows. Mm. The farmer doesn't know how. So in one passage, Jesus is speaking of God's providential activity mm. in, in, in natural phenomena. Mm. In another parable, he refers to the natural phenomena phenomenon as if it's happening mm. by itself, and he doesn't bring in God there. Mm. So to use the technical term, the, 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 there's a thing known as methodological reductionism. Mm. That is, when a physician is, is taking somebody's blood pressure mm. um, and temperature, he's not bringing God in, whether he's mm. a Christian physician or a non-Christian. Mm. He, he, he's, he's, he's employing a methodologically reductionist mm. method. He doesn't mm. have to invoke God yeah. to find out this person's temperature or yeah. blood pressure. So you, but, you, he's not yeah. an but, yeah. but that's different from ontological reductionism that yeah. says, ah, oh, because we are studying these things, we leave, God has nothing to do with it. Mm. Does that make sense? It does. So you don't need to see a Christian doctor. Absolutely. You need to see a doctor. That's right. <laughs> and and, and that's you can right. study the Mona Lisa yeah. painting. Yeah. You can study, for example, um, a physicist may study the um, pigments yeah. of, of, of the paint and the way that they will absorb different light frequencies and, mm. and reflect different light, light frequencies. Yeah. Um, a forensic scientist may examine the canvas and the history of the canvas. Mm. A chemist may look at the chemical composition of the, of the paint. They may all do that. That's perfectly mm. valid science. But in doing that, you don't say, therefore, there's no Leonardo da Vinci and there was no, no. need for Leonardo da Vinci. Or I can understand how he paints that way. That, that's right. So, yeah, so it's, there's yeah. the whole art thing, which is completely impossible uh, to uh, uh, absolutely of, yes. of discovery so, and invention. Uh, and, and it's just a, it, it's just a confusion of yeah, thought. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or you as a man on board ship yeah. and um, he sees a flashing light. And he's got a physicist by the side of him, and he says, well, "Why is that light flashing?" Mm -hmm. So the physicist, ex why am I seeing that light flashing? Yeah. Physicist explains what's happening with a certain light emitting photons, yeah. and then how the photons go through the red, through yeah. through the pupil into the, you know, hit, hit yeah. the red, and yeah. then go through yeah. the optic nerve, etc., etc. The captain of the ship comes along. And he said, oh, I can tell you why that light's flashing. There's a lighthouse there, and it's warning us that there are rocks. Mm. Which is the true answer? Well, they're both it's true, true. but they, yeah. they, 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 they are different levels of answer. And mm. I think that I think there's a huge confusion at the moment. Mm. Um, I think it's a confusion which unbelievers have, and I think it's a confusion which some Christians mm. have as well. Well, I think we've done a good job there. I think we did a good job on looking at Sam Harris. I would recommend people listen to him because he's actually quite an interesting thinker per se. Yeah. Um, and it is a very useful, intelligent thought process. And there's not enough of that about these days. Um, and he's also a big fan of free speech, which we might talk about again sometime. Yeah, so. uh, and that brings him into contact with other people who he might not otherwise be in contact with. Yeah. But I do think, and I, I think we've shown today that some of his criticisms of the Bible are completely invalid. Yes. Yeah, because they're, they're either intentional or otherwise misapprehensions. Yes. Um, you know, it, the images created in order to worship is what the Bible is talking about, and that's clearly wrong. Yeah. And he seems to have misunderstood that. Yeah. Slavery today means something completely different to what slavery meant yes. way back then. Yes. And that's completely wrong. And a lot of these situations which, on the face of it, look brutal, were actually replacing far greater brutality yes. and yes. never came to pass anyway. Yes. And again, so from that point of view, um, you know, in my mind, uh, uh, let alone my heart, the, the, the Bible still stands there. And, and I think it's good for people to realise that. So that's been quite useful. Um, good, I've enjoyed being here. So thank you very Sorry much. Sorry if I've talked too much. Hey, no, it's a real pleasure. Your wife didn't stop us. Hey, that's <laughs> great. On we go. Um, Stephen Clark, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you.